listening to the voices behind women's cricket chat that's alex hannah georgie and cassie coming up on today's podcast we've got northern superchargers yorkshire diamonds northern diamond superstar katie levick if you don't know who katie is katie is a phenomenal leg spinner whose action has also been described as a, a frog in a blender and what's so amazing about katie is that She herself didn't think that she would be playing at the beginning of the season and after getting long COVID. So Katie talks about growing up in Sheffield, being a proud Yorkshire girl and the after effects of long COVID. Joining us today, we have Katie Levick of Yorkshire, Yorkshire Diamonds, Northern Diamonds, Northern Superchargers. Can you tell she's a northerner? So welcome to Women's Cricket Chat, Katie. Thanks for having me. I'll try and do my best northern accent throughout. Yeah, you've got to make yourself sound as northern as possible, obviously. Spent years turning this down, so I'll try and build up it back up again. <laughs> to be fair, it's about time we had someone from the White Rose County, because we had Alex Hartley of Lancashire. So it's about time we got someone from, you know, Yorkshire. Yeah, yeah. I think the most northern you tried to claim was Jenny Gunn. So, I mean, we'll claim her, but it's good to get some more representation on the north. That exactly. was Hannah. That was not me. That was Hannah and George. Nah, guilty. Those two, guilty. those who claimed her as a northerner. I was like, nah, she's a Midlander. Not enough. Anyway, we digress. So, Katie, obviously, we want to hear all about you, your cricketing life. So, kick us off with how did it all begin? What got you into cricket in the first place? Probably boring and similar to everyone's, but I've got an older brother, which means you just watch whatever he has to do uh, in his extracurricular activities. So I uh, wasn't much of a fan of football because I was cold. And then cricket took place in the summer and there was food around at all times. And it seems to be more inclusive to girls when I watched his team, he had a girl in it. So um, just took myself off and joined in and then never looked back. So did you join his team as a girl? Well, he's four years older than me. So I didn't join his specific team at that stage, but I was at his club um, and I noticed kids my age playing so went to join them. Um, And then stayed with that club throughout all of my career. And we've ended up playing together in the senior teams for quite a few years. Um, But he was always much better than me. So he was usually first team and I was second. But that's okay. You know, first the worst, second best. We'll take that. And so do you ever play on teams together? We used to, yeah. He quit um, quite a few years ago because he thought it took up too much of his time, which, you know, is probably accurate. Um, And I kept going. um, But I left that club because I moved up to Leeds. So I'm not around my hometown anymore. But um, yeah, we played quite a few years together and he was always like your biggest opponent like siblings are. And he gave me endless hours of bowling practice because he always wanted to bat. So he's probably owe him a lot to where my career is right now. And obviously growing up, you I, were you born in Sheffield? Yes. Yep. I'm, I'm not sure how long you lived in Sheffield for, but going, did you go through the Yorkshire ranks? So from like under 11s and whatnot? Yeah, so I um, lived in Sheffield all my life until I moved to Leeds about five, six years ago. Um, and yeah, from I was very lucky that my club, when I first joined that very first training session, the coach was also involved in the district pathways and got me into South Yorkshire. And then from then on, got into the Yorkshire ranks from under 11s and stayed in there till the present day, And even though it sort of doesn't exist anymore. But yeah, I'm still a Yorkshire player. And did you come up during like under 11s etc with anyone on the men's side like Joe Root perhaps because you are a similar age yeah actually I got onto the um the boys academy at Yorkshire for a couple of years and at the same time there was um Joe Root, Johnny Bairstow, Gary Balance had just come over and joined um so yeah it was a decent cohort to be involved in um plus Joe Root was sort of like a little mythical legend even back then in Sheffield there was this player that was phenomenal and he was going to go somewhere so I'd seen him in and around club stuff um, but yeah then we got to be on the same academy which was looks quite good now it looks like the worst name drop ever just then but facts own it take it own it go with it that's fine and so you say you started playing with your brother and he was we're going to go with batter because that's what we're taking these days he was a batter so did that sort of mean you had no choice but to be a bowler yeah, I mean, he always wanted to bat. He was an all-rounder, but being a boy and four years older than me meant he got me out pretty much immediately. So then I was instantly bowling again all the time. 
um, and somehow just naturally bowled leg spins through no coaching or want or desire of my own. I thought I was bowling really fast, but I was actually bowling out of the back of my hand and got told to stop what you're doing instantly and you're bowling leg spin. So lucky that I always had someone to practice my skills against in Adam and uh, yeah, did that all the time. And on the topic of the bowling, you have previously been described your action as the frog in a blender, which I would own, you know, we've all heard about the frog on tail enders, so we'll take the frog. What do you say to that? You, I guess you don't need to really say much. You can just say, well, my stats speak for themselves. Yeah, exactly. I think actually my current workplace office started the frog in a blender thing because I still believe I'm thoroughly orthodox and I am bowling standard leg spin, but everyone seems insistent that I am indeed this frog in a blender. So I'm sort of owning it now and I use it before anyone else can get it in. But like you said, I've got a fair few wickets doing it, so it must be all right. And uh, don't plan on changing it anytime soon. And obviously you are a Yorkshire girl through and through. When it came time to pick a team for the 100 or when you got scouted, was there ever any consideration to play for any other team or was it always going to be Northern Superchargers? Interesting, actually, yeah. The 100 was the first time that I actually had other teams coming in for me as well. Like at the Super League, Yorkshire, I think because of how it was set up and no one really knew what that sort of was going to be like, I just went straight to Yorkshire Diamonds and stayed there throughout. But with the 100 being more of an open draft and open playing field, I did have a few other offers come in and then it was very much about weighing up do who do I want to play for and what role am I going to get in these teams and obviously I absolutely adore playing for the north and and Headingley was always a big appeal um but yeah it was an interesting one that was the first time I've ever actually felt in demand and wasn't just oh this is my only option I'll stay in the north um I had to make Danny work for it to keep me basically are we allowed to be cheeky and ask which teams wanted to scout you and draft you? Or is that a secret you want to keep close to your chest? I mean, I might keep it a secret just in case they come back in next year. We never know. And then it looks a bit. But um, yeah, it was just alternative teams that weren't the Northern Superchargers. Intriguing. Hmm. Feel free to set up a poll on your Twitter and you see if people can guess it. I mean, that could be good content for you guys. Sounds wonderful to me. So obviously the 100 only kicked off this year and you've previously played Northern Diamonds, Yorkshire Diamonds, Yorkshire and I spoke to you a couple of years ago when it was on the brink of what is going to happen with women's cricket so over the last two years what is what kind of changes have you seen because there's been so much development on the women's side. Yeah I mean I remember when I spoke to you literally didn't even know if we're going to continue playing cricket because we didn't know what teams were going to be out there for us it was all very much secretive and oh there's a rumor of it's going to be regions and there's a rumor of this and like you could have plucked anything out and it could have literally plucked in any format and so at that stage I was thinking who's going to want this late 20s county player so this might be my career over and then the 100 came around the regional structure and luckily I think the regional structure being quite heavily Yorkshire based played into my favor and then the 100 is just been the biggest improvement in women's cricket I've seen in, in my lifetime it exceeded all expectations we could possibly hope for. I think no one realised how much people would buy into the women's side, I don't think, even us as players. And it was obviously very marmite for the males fans before it started. And we kept trying to bang, like, oh, I swear it'll be good for the women's game if you give it a chance. But even I think everyone in the back of their minds was thinking this is more the party line and it might not actually be that great for the women's game. But it was just unbelievable. And I think the ECB really did us a solid in keeping true to their promise about investing in women's cricket and the 100 was the first example of how great it can be if we put some backing into it. Was it considered in terms of the ECB a proper job and did you get actual payment because we know there have been instances before at like county level I think Somerset was a prime example where players were funding themselves transport kit etc so was it the opposite for you guys in the 100? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that wasn't just Somerset in the county set That was all of us. You very much were out of pocket playing county cricket. And only in the last couple of years did you get perks, such as hotel stays and, and coach travel. And up until then, it was, you know, splitting petrol money between you. The 100 is like similar. The Super League got better year on year, but even that started out like the first year of the Kia Super League. If you didn't play in the game, you didn't get paid. So you would like absolutely buy in for that spot in the 11 purely to make it worthwhile like why have I taken this week off work if I'm not getting any money sort of thing 
And um, you do obviously do it for the love of the game. And I think women have always done that. But the 100 was the first time got some sort of decent wage where I think it wasn't so much of a choice between your job and cricket for at least that month anyway. Obviously wasn't on a par with the men, but that's another issue. But um, it was definitely better than it's ever been. So I think that's the positive you've got to take from it. It just keeps getting better. And so obviously you work your normal job at the same time, marketing manager at Yorkshire County Cricket Club's coaching department. But um, are you on a contract with Yorkshire now as well as Northern Diamonds or is it payment during the 100 time and then back to the day job? Yeah, very much that. So I'm still, I class myself amateur and I have like, I look at it as like freelance contracts for cricket. So the 100, I got employed for that month and I'm very lucky my employer allows me to be very hit and miss and working remotely during that month. Um, and then we're pay as you pay players, we're clusters at the region. So again, it's um, not so much as a commitment in terms of a monthly wage, but if you're in the team and you, you're not out of pocket anymore, basically like county players. And also just on the 100, you were in a team with the likes of Lauren Winfield Hill, Laura Kimmins, Jemima Rodriguez. What was it like to be in an environment with those kinds of players with international experience and what did you really learn from them? Yeah, I heard they said the same thing. They were like, oh, we're in a team with Katie Levick. This is amazing. But yeah, Jemmy is the most phenomenal cricketer I think I've ever met. And she's just turned 21 and it blows your mind of how smart she is and how she goes about her business. And she likes to remind me that she's got 10 years on me, which was lovely. And then players like Laura Kimmins this year was so refreshing in that they're essentially like our Australian counterparts in the county set up in that they've never had these opportunities either. So she just loved every moment. and. She really just put that positivity into you to make you realise and take a step back every so often, thinking like, Do you know what, we're, we're taking part in currently is amazing. Like, make sure you're enjoying it and you're not just trying to get through because it's so tiring and you're drained and all this lot. So, yeah, it's really interesting taking to the change room as those sort of players. You don't sort of almost appreciate it at the time. And then you step back and you think, I was just in a change room with Laura Wolvar, who's just hit four sixes and over against Hayley Matthews. And you're like... I was bowling at her last week, so I'm going to claim that, that I've got her in form. So they're just their experiences that you'd never thought you'd get in the county setup. So they're just such a great opportunity every time they come around. And for you, it must have been particularly special being able to take part in the 100 this year after your experience with COVID and long COVID last year. And there was a time that you didn't think you'd even get back out on the pitch. And what was that like to when from when you got your diagnosis to really, really struggling and then having to sort of really fight your way back into the cricket world? Yeah, I, I keep forgetting that, that was actually this year. Like, and people bring it up and I, I forget how my year started. And it's I think it's really good. I took a step back and it, especially in the hundred to realise how well I've done to get to this stage, because then the briefest format possibly I got diagnosed in October and I was wiped out till Christmas and then. I did a return to play that kept getting a hold at every possible stage because they found um, anomalies with my heart. And then when I could come back in January again, we found more anomalies. And then we we think COVID has now given me asthma and all these things. And so even as of April, we'd been working towards this May return day and I got stopped from all training again in April. And I was at that stage, we were talking about, right, if we can get you ready for the 100, that'd be great. And I'm thinking I've got a regional season like I want to be ready for in a couple of weeks, let alone the 100. And then somehow I was there for the first regional game. And yeah, this winter was the first time I ever realised I'm not ready to retire. And I thought I would, I always thought my mind would make the decision, but I realised now I think my body will because I didn't want it to end. And it was quite a, like a humbling sort of experience. Now you look back, we put that fire back in me and made you realise what cricket actually meant and why I was playing it rather than, oh, just try and get through this season and you might have some fun sort of thing. So everything I'm doing this year, I'm just enjoying the moment because for the first time I realised it might be the last time. And how did you manage your recovery from COVID and long COVID? Was it a lot of 10 minute walks? And with the country being locked down for a second and a third time, did that kind of help aid you in your recovery in a way? Yeah, so there's like a, a proper return to play you're supposed to do in elite sport um, where you start off where you have to go for an ECG um, and mine flagged up anomalies. So that put a stop to my return to play instantly. And then you're supposed to go through these stages where like the first one's a 10 minute walk and you're supposed to keep your heart rate under 150 and I couldn't do it. And um, 
and then you do a 10 second run in and you do it like times four times two and you keep your heart rate and I just couldn't do any of them and it went on for about two three months where my heart rate didn't improve in any of these sessions no matter what I did I was still incredibly fatigued after everything um like our medical staff I had to fill out a survey every day about how many hours I'd napped after training because we had to try and monitor that right okay if she does a 20 second run she sleeps four hours that's probably not ideal like and um it was just really insane but in, at the same time we're so lucky this regional structure came in because I had a medical staff to look after me so I had a physio and an SNC and access um to the top cardiologists through the ECB I got put onto their health insurance so I could make sure I try and jump lists because as you said like lockdowns had hit and so them saying we want to send you for another ECG or um, an MRI you're firmly bottom of the list because you're not important but thankfully being involved in the system got me we got these processes sped up so it was incredibly long and frustrating and I think I've had every test in a hospital you could possibly have but um we're just again so lucky that we had those procedures in place because had I been just in the county setup I would have returned to my training on a Sunday evening in some sports hall and I'd have gone not to 100 and who knows what could have happened because like when not talking about a muscular injury we're talking about my heart and lungs which turns out pretty important so it's quite a big deal this winter so very thankful for, for the advancements of women's sport and so did it make it even more special when you stepped out on that pitch well the first northern superchargers game birmingham phoenix so when you put on that purple kit for the first time and actually went out and played your first hundred games you sort of take a moment to take it all in yeah definitely i think i had a bigger moment when i did it at Henley for the northern diamonds it was the first game of the season and a month prior, I'd been told to stop doing all exercise again. You can't you can't go for walks or anything. And so then the fact I was walking out for the first 50 of a game at Headingley, I did take a moment in that change room just to sit and enjoy it because I thought this was so far away just a couple of weeks ago. And yet somehow you're here, like, well done. That We have a thing in the Diamonds. We always say we celebrate the little wins. And like for me, getting on the pitch was the little win. Whatever happened on the pitch was then an added bonus. So... We really take the time to to celebrate those wins and um, had my parents in the crowd, which was nice. And um, there was a lot of times this winter I didn't think that we'd be watching me play cricket again. So it was a very nice moment. And then the 100 was again, yeah, just take a step back and realise how lucky you are sort of thing. And in the 100, you actually had your first experience playing at Lords, which is just, it's mad to think you're one of the top wicket takers in women's domestic cricket and you'd never played at Lords before. What was it like for the first time? Yeah, that was like something I, I spotted on the fixture card for the original one that was supposed to take place before COVID ruined the world. And um, that was like a massive moment. I thought, wow, I'm going to play at Lords. Like, that's that's incredible. Like Even I'd watched friends play in the books finals at the unis and they get slated. They've played at Lords, but they've played at the nursery ground. They haven't played at Lords sort of thing. And even the girls in the England setup, they only get there if you get to a, sort of a World Cup final. So... It was, I think I tweeted about it at the time, it wasn't even like a bucket list goal because there was no point having it because it was never going to happen sort of thing. So um, that was something that we as a team as well, we made a point of, we were training there the day before. So we were like, right, everyone, there is no level of embarrassing whilst you're here, go and do what you need to do. If you want 400 pictures on that square, like go and take them. Like you want to film every aspect of it, do it. And we allowed ourselves to indulge in the moment and take it in because we realised how lucky we are. And especially, like, I think this week I noticed that Eccles, um, Sophie Eccleston hasn't played at Lords yet and her brother's going to play in a club game. And you think, right, world number one bowler hasn't done this and yet I have and I'm just some leggy from Yorkshire, like, enjoy this moment. So, yeah, it was great that we all just allowed ourselves to proper badger and uh, we enjoyed our time at Lords thoroughly, even though we lost. But what a day. Yeah, and I actually happened to be there at the game. Different dugout to you guys in the London Spirit one. But you guys were went into that match on a 100% win record. But how did the 100% record suddenly just spiral you guys into going on that losing momentum run, in a sense? Yeah, I mean, I wish I knew. Because if I knew, we might have some prize money and a medal right now. But... um yeah, it was such a bizarre one. We, we hit the ground running absolutely flying. I don't know whether that was a good or a bad thing in hindsight, but um, I think multiple things just took over. And um, 
you know, we relied so heavily on Jemmy and she hit so many runs for us and just little sneaky things came in, a bit of complacency, probably a bit of tiredness and probably a lack of experience from a lot of us that we'd not been in those sort of tournaments at that sort of standard before. And um, we kept, it's the same throughout the Diamonds, I feel like we keep winning somehow, not through domination, but it was like at the Oval game when we defended 109, which is absurd. Um, I think that sort of put it in his heads that we should be doing that every time and uh, making it hard for ourselves when we could make life a lot easier if we, we hit some more runs and then we wouldn't have to pull out some performances out of us. I won't say in case you can't swear on this pod. But yeah, it just a lot of things. I think we just looked a bit green towards the end and uh, it was sad they ended how it did. But I think we still put in a good show in, in that tournament and we probably weren't one of the favourites to start off with and we put in some really stellar performances. So hopefully next year if we can keep a similar sort of group will be a bit more experienced for the tournament play. And also, what is it like to bowl to someone like Deandra Dottin, world boss, hits the ball very hard, very far? Like she, she would terrify me in the net. She'd just be hitting it, and I'd be like, "Oh God, I don't want to get hit." Even though there was no possible way I could. But what is it like bowling to someone like Deandra Dottin and Heather Knight as well? Because they are both accomplished, stellar players, but in different ways. Yeah, players like Heather, um, I think I've played against Trev since I was a kid and we've grown up through like the Super 4 systems and stuff. So, you know, she's probably going to hit a ton most games. So you just come to expect that and she is world class. But especially for someone like me that's never played international, that's how I want to show that I am good enough to have done these things and how much of a, a decent player I am if I can go in these battles and come out pretty good. Dotting, yeah, she is imposing. And, you know, you talk about that in your meetings before when you talk about what what can she do? You like, she hits the ball very hard. Like, that is a strength. Um, But we had Laura Kimmins, who is genuinely the hardest hitter of a ball I've ever faced. And that first day of training in the nets, she hit one back at Lindsay so hard, she almost fractured a finger and had a bruise on her bicep that that didn't go for the entire tournament. And... It was the first time I asked Danny, can I bowl in a helmet? Because she is hitting this so hard back at me. And also from switch hits, which made no sense. You couldn't even say it yourself knowing where it was going because she got into the most rogue positions and just nailed it back at you. But yeah, you want um, to be challenged by batters because it shows how good you are as a bowler. So um, you just relish those occasions because then when you get stomach hits, you look pretty good on TV. I would love to have seen you just turn up in the hundreds bowling in your helmet. Like, sorry, guys. Safety first. Got to protect the money maker. Well, I didn't get to use it batting, so I've got to use that purple helmet for something. Like, I'm just going to wear it to work. I'm just going to wear it in everyday occasions. We never got to see me grace the pads, so get it out while I can. Yeah, and on the topic of unfortunate losses and change in fortune, you have been, I wouldn't say, unlucky enough to be runner-up in the inaugural Rachel Hayhoe Flint Trophy and Charlotte Edwards Cup, and we're just talking to you off the back of the Charlotte Edwards Cup, which probably is quite raw still from Sunday. What are your hopes going forward? I mean, I know it would be the title rather than runners-up medal, but what's it like to lose in the final twice in a row? Yeah, I mean, you talk about raw feelings. My body is still very raw. That was like the longest day of my life, playing those two back-to-back T20s in the heat. Yeah, obviously we're really disappointed and... We set out just to try and win some silverware, but we've also set out to try and put the North back on the map. And that's something we've really been hammering home because it's, I think it is a forgotten entity of cricket. Sussex and Kent were so dominant for so many years and the county championships leading into it. You only have to look at the KSL to see that Western Storm and Surrey Stars, not Surrey, yeah, Surrey Stars, and have won all those and the Vipers. So we would really keen to put the north back on the map as a powerhouse nation and we're not the easy wins you're gonna go out and get in these sort of competitions so although yeah we are very disappointed to be runners up twice we put ourselves in that position twice which other teams haven't done so you have to look at the positives from that if you'd have told us at the beginning of the year you're going to come second in the the first charlotte edwards cup you know we'd take it even though we wanted that that medal um and we're still very much in the running for the hey ho so hopefully go one better there because I'm not sure my ticket can take anymore, especially after this year. And also, I don't want to keep trying to hide in tears behind sunglasses because that is just too, too hard at my age. But hopefully we can get something this year. And if not, I'll just have to be happy with silver medals. I'm on the podium still, aren't I? And uh, just on the Charlotte Edwards Cup. Yes, although you didn't win it, you did put on a comprehensive performance in the knockout game against the Southern Vipers, bowled them out. 
and you won by 19 wickets. How pleasing was it to beat the Vipers because everyone seems to struggle against them and somehow you guys keep coming up against them and keep performing? Yeah, obviously last year the final result was in the reverse and so we were really set out in that first game to try and avenge that loss in the Hayhoe Flint final and put in a performance against the Vipers because quite frankly they've been far too dominant and someone else needs to win a trophy. So we worked it out and obviously in the format of the day, if you can get a good comprehensive win under your belts, we thought it put some good momentum in us going into the second game because you're going to need something to carry into that second game. Um, but I think maybe we did leave it all out there in the first one. But we still put in a good showing for both for both matches. So we were really happy with how we performed. It wasn't a rollover in the second game. Like a lot of people thought it could be with the format of one team playing twice and the other team coming in fresh. But um, yeah, it's it's weird one of those days where you sort of forget you beat the Vipers in the morning because the last in memory is the loss in the final. But it's important that we remember we did have a really good um, showing against them, especially considering we play them again in a few weeks. It can't have helped though as well with your match against Vipers, you finished and then you had an hour break and then had to come back out again. How do you sort of focus your mind on something other than cricket and other than, oh God, this is the Charlotte Edwards Cup final at four o'clock? I think um, that day we were lucky that it was hotter than the sun. And so we, in the in between break, it was how on earth can I cool down quick enough? And we're all stood in an ice bath trying to desperately get his legs ready to go again. And then how many bread rolls can I smash down to get me going for the second game in between? So because it is such a quick turnaround, you sort of didn't allow yourself to dwell on the fact, right, we're now in the final. It was like, right, half a job done sort of thing. And you just go into the second innings. So um, in that occasion, it, it was good that you couldn't dwell on it too much. But obviously, I think there's a lot of sore bodies going into that second game. And I can't ignore the bread roll that you called it there. Are you going to wade in on the bread roll debate there? Because it could be a roll. We could have a bun. My mum calls it a stotty if it's a large bun because she pretends that she's still from the north, which she is, but she doesn't sound it anymore. We've got, what else can we call them? Oh, I'm usually a bread cake from Sheffield, but I've tried to turn down that dialect knowing that no one understands what a bread cake is. So I've gone for the universal term of bread roll. See, I got into so many arguments about this at university. So I call it a bread roll. I went to a predominantly northern uni. Everyone was like, no, it's this, it's this, it's this. I was just like, I call it a bread roll. You call it a bap. Someone else calls it a bread cake. I can't keep up. Exactly. That's why I'm just trying to be universal so that I appeal to the wider audience. So I'm trying to tone down the Sheffieldness, but not forget my roots entirely. It's bread cake for the record. However, bread roll for the masses. You heard it here first. It's a bread cake. I don't actually think I've ever heard it called a bread cake before, but we'll take that. You obviously have a lot of fun in your cricket as well with the Northern Superchargers, the Diamonds, Yorkshire, whoever. What was really nice to see during the 100 was when it looked like you'd gone for a, a shit shirt night. I don't know how to call that in a PC term. A rubbish shirt doesn't have the same ring to it. We went for a rubbish shirt night. Was that just something on a whim? Or was it like, you know what, we're going to show that we're, we've really got this team dynamic going? It's something that we've always done in the Northern teams. There's always one dedicated shit shirt night, and that is what it is, so we'll call it that. Shit blouses are acceptable as well. And so we always try and do at least one social like that uh, during the competition. It was actually Laura Kimmins' birthday that day. So we said, right, that is the theme for the social tonight. And we all headed to TK Maxx to buy variant. I had this diamante tiger that looked almost like a caftan. It was that big, but did the job. It had a tiger on the front and the back so you could see the party end, whichever way I was leaving. Um, but yeah, it was just something we always... We play as a team because we have so much fun together. And I think that's the reason that our team always gets commented on that we're older and we're all, you know, heading towards 30s slash Jenny Gunn is well in her 30s. And, um, but we keep playing because we just love it so much and we love our dynamic. Find that one funny there, Alex. Yeah, I mean, it just brought me back to when we interviewed Enid Bakewell and she just, she absolutely savaged Jenny Gunn and her age. She called her 36 when, no, she called her like 38 when she's not 38. And then, well, Enid was just on another level. So that's why I started laughing. Anyway, Jenny Gunn like, hates or any chat about age. So I thought I'd chuck it in and I'll be the one to get the dig in because I'm in my 30s now as well. So I'm in part of the gang. And if I can call someone older than me in a cricket team, it's bloody good going because everyone's babies now. So I'll uh, get the digs in while I can. Yeah, like yeah. even some of them. Like I thought Jemima would reason some more my age. And then you said she was 21. And I was like, what? She turned 21 like yesterday. So it's insane that she was in the Super League with us when she was 18. And 
what she did this year she was 20 it's just incredible and annoying and is um jemima a an official northerner because georgie did interview her a while back and the word spud kept coming up and people believed i don't know whether they did or not but some people believed that she sounded northern when she said the word spud so yes we're claiming her we got her over here in the super league as an 18 year old and she loves it and she came back because she wanted to play with us again and she loves the north and the north has adopted her and you know what a better human to try and adopt she said she's going to buy a house in yorkshire so we're holding her to that so yeah she's thoroughly an adopted northerner i can confirm she loves the north there was a lot of i love the north the north is great i'm a northerner and I'm going to put this out there. I'm pretty sure if she's coming back for the 100 next year, Northern Superchargers, you, you can pretty much felt tip her name in now, not pencil. I mean, she'd look stupid in any other colour than purple. But I mean, saying this, I'm hoping I'm in purple as well. Who knows? But she, yeah, we've claimed, claimed to her early. We've put the, like, joined her to the Northern cult. She's one of us now. She's not going anywhere else. I don't think they'd accept her as much as anywhere else, like her little quirky ways and her playing music all the time. We love that crap. No, not crap, it's great. <laughs> yeah so obviously you're working your other job and you're balancing all that at the same time and you're still playing your county stuff so it's all back to Rachel Hayhoe Flint in the 50 over mindset mindset now yeah very much so like the, during the 100 I had a bit more leniency with work they knew that that schedule was so chocker and we we're constantly on the road that I probably wasn't going to get much work done now like the, the beginning part of this week I've been in the office all week and then we head up to Durham tomorrow which is our second home ground and we're there until Sunday so then like now I've left the office tomorrow afternoon before I head up to Durham they'll be switching back to cricket mindset and I have to try and do it in that way where I have little blocks of work Katie and then cricket Lev. Cricket Lev is a great nickname. I really like that. Yeah, self-coined, but I don't have a first name in cricket. I'm only ever known as Lev. I'm like Madonna. I just have one name and I just go by Lev everywhere. You heard it here first again. Katie Levick is the Madonna of the cricket world, a.k.a. Lev. Yeah, but I look at my actual age rather than Madonna. When you, go on, when you go on nights out, do they say, Lev, do you want a Bev? They do. And usually I'm with Beth Langston, who goes by Bev. So it's like, Lev and Bev, do you want a Bev? And then when you've had a few bevs, it's lev, bev, lev, 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 yeah? And it makes sense to me, and I just nod along because I've had several beers. Yeah. No, just one, just one lemonade. Yeah, athlete, apologies, yeah, that's what I meant. And obviously cricket is a team sport. Have you ever been involved in any fun team bonding exercises? Oh, interesting question. I mean, all of our socials are usually team bonding, um, but you probably can't talk about those. I remember one year for the Yorkshire, we got, um, we went to like one of those activity adventure things where you've got to do like rock climbing and tunneling and all that jazz. Um, and that brought us together. And that was actually then the year that we won County Champs. So I reckon it's probably down to that experience that it was good having to go archery. I dressed in full green gears. So I looked like Robin Hood because I thought that'd give me the edge, but didn't so much. But yeah, we're, we're a pretty sociable bunch. So if we're not playing cricket, we're usually having a coffee together or something like that because we're saddos and just like each other's company a lot. So that, that bonds as well. Fake it till you make it. And then next year, obviously the 100 will be less COVID hit, we hope. God, God in heaven help us. So more team bonding next year for the Northern Superchargers. Will we see you doing some kind of total wipeout-esque activities? Hopefully. I mean, I think that's one of the main things that made me want to really continue on next year in the 100 because I want to experience it out of COVID times. Because as much as it was, you know, one team, one dream and you're doing everything the same, you couldn't f still fully like socialise and do things with the men's team as much. There was still bubbles. Um, so it would be great to be able to pick their brains more, train with them, maybe do all that sort of jazz. Um, but yeah, hopefully some more team bonding and not just us dancing very far away on a balcony because the men have hit some runs. Oi, oi, trying to bond with the men, are we? Always. I've got a, a free finger that needs a ring on it. Don't we all? Don't we all? But it doesn't work, you know, no matter how much Beyonce I shout, you know, or like it, put a ring on it, none of that. But yeah, so working alongside the men, you're all one franchise. That'd be quite nice next year. What kind of stuff are you hoping to be able to do? Because... There were rumours before that some franchises were going to try and sort of partner up a male player with a female player, you know, so you've got your batting body or your bowling body. So that could be quite good fun. 
Yeah, that'd be great. I mean, we had Adil Rashid and, and Majib in our teams. If I got part of any of those guys to work with, it'd been pretty good. It'd just be nice not to have to be like passing ships at training or sending each other messages in the WhatsApp group saying good luck if you could just see them or wish them good or talk about the games afterwards, you know. Even people like Darren Lehman, who's the coach of the men's, he had so much to offer us after the games and stuff. And um, he could chat to you and pass on some um, some words of advice. It'd be great to be able to just fully sit down and pick their brains and not worry about wearing a mask or being two metres apart or potentially crossing bubbles sort of thing. Because at the end of the day, I am a cricket badger and these guys have played so much more cricket than we have. So I just want to use it as an opportunity to learn. We love cricket badgers on this podcast. And you've mentioned before that it's one brand, two teams. How important was that for you as players and also for the women's game that it was just one entity? Yeah, it, it was massive. And I think it's the what that was the main thing I kept saying is that for the first time ever, even though we've done double headers before, kids could go, a boy and a girl could go and watch and they could grow up to be either of those teams on display and they can both support the same team and grow up wishing like, oh, I want to be a supercharger. As much as it's been great that we play double headers in the Kia Super League, it's like, oh, I'm this morning I'm a Western Storm fan and the afternoon I'm a Somerset men's fan. It's just not the same sort of thing, you know. It can be quite confusing if you're trying to get kids into it. Like why a girl could be like, why can't I play for Somerset, for example? But the superchargers and well, the the hundred brands was that I think that was the main thing that's inspiring is that it's it was all one team. There was we played at the same grounds, we we're in the same kit. It was really um, easy for children and new fans to understand that that is the team it's just the men's and women's versions of it and I think that was the best thing and even like I said in COVID years there was still that overlap with the players and the knowledge that the men were supporting us and we were supporting the men and you know they, they knew exactly what you were about rather than oh a random KSL team is playing before us today that I've not even seen that competition before sort of thing so that was massive and I think going forward that's only going to get bigger if we can keep doing you know, stuff out in the community and things like that with uh, male and female presence, I think it'll be massive for the future generation. And how about on the topic of the double headers? Originally, that wasn't really the plan. So it's sort of a, a happy accident that's come out there. Um, obviously, at the moment, the women have played all their games before the men. Would you like to see that reversed in some games, do you think? Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's an interesting one. I've always been against double headers because I hated them in the Super League because no one had come to watch us. We were very much like the support act at a gig that you, you don't turn up for. You go and get your beers during that part and then you watch the main act. And that's how it always felt for the women's game being on beforehand. But this year, there were thousands in regardless of when the men started. And that's what really changed my mindset. And um, I think the double headers should be there to stay and it would be nice to see the reverse if we have actually got an audience, because if we do flip and become the evening game, do you keep the family audience? Are they there specifically for you because, or do they get off early because they've seen the main event men sort of thing? So I would like to to flip it and see how it is. Obviously, also playing under lights is great for some aspects. So that'd be cool to, to try out. But I think that'd be a good test to see if we have got a, a female fan base, because Usually the female fan base is more family orientated and coming out in the morning is the thing that they want to do um, to see if it is still there to support us in the evening as well. We've obviously talked a lot about Yorkshire, Yorkshire Diamonds, Northern Diamonds, etc. Who are the up and coming players that we should be looking out for? All of our players are up and coming regardless of age. We call ourselves the ever developing diamonds because age is just a number. As said by Jenny Gunn, 54 year old cricketer extraordinaire. No, but seriously, we're, we are... 54-year-old Northerner. Northerner, yeah, she is one of us. She's in the Northern cult of Jemmy. Yeah, we've got um, a core group of players that are late 20s, 30s that are brilliant. And then we've got these younger ones that you forget you've got easily 10 years on, like Rachel Slater, who's just first to our T20 team, opened the bowl in left arm team and did such a fantastic job. Uh, she'd been around the Yorkshire setup for the time, but is really starting to do it on a senior level now. Um, Bess Heath, bam, bam, hits the ball harder than most people have ever seen and is stronger than ball. And she's fantastic. I think she's got a great future ahead of her. Um, Leah Dobson, similarly, like we had Bess and Leah Dobson opening the batting for us, regardless of Lauren Winfield Hill coming back because we just had so much faith. Yeah, we're, we're the ever-developing ageing diamonds and we're all still up and coming and got loads to prove. So could we see... Uh... Lev in the England side in the future, you know, you've got time still. You're only 31. Jenny Gunn's 506. 
I, I'm 30 and about four weeks, so I'm I'm taking that one straight off. You've just aged me. I thought you said 31 earlier. I apologise. No, you're th- if you're only 30, then we round you down to 20. I turned 30 yeah. just as the bubble took place for the 100, so that was a great time. Um, yeah, to she do literally just said she was in her 30s. I think that's what threw you off, Georgie. Well, I could say I am in my 20s and I'll give you any kind of space in there, I guess. But, yeah, I'm sorry I aged you. Apologies. Yeah, maybe, maybe we'll see Lev in the England side in the future. I mean, you could just wait a year and release this podcast in a year and then what you've said is true, not just a heart wreck. Yeah, the England set I mean, never say never. I've pulled myself out of the setup, I think, more times than I can remember. But as it's ever changing now and it does seem to be more of an open door and people are getting picked on performances, I think Glennie is quite set in that she's doing a sterling job for them um, as a leggy currently. But never say never if it'd have to be the circumstances are right for me the last couple of times it's come around they haven't been right with my working scenario and where, where the women's game was at um so it's not on my radar to that's not my goal like my main goal is I want to get some silverware for the north and stop picking up silver medals but um who knows who knows and um you were there at the inception of the KSL then with the Rachel Hayhoe Flint and the Charlotte Edwards Cup and the 100 of course and it's helped progress the game further. Where do you see the women's game going over the next couple of years? Yeah, I mean, when you put it like that, I sound like a founding father. I've been at the start of all of these competitions. Maybe I am 31. Maybe that's where... I... Yeah, every competition that's coming, I think, has progressed the game. And that's all we can ask for. Um, the steps going forward might not have been as big as everyone hoped. Might not have made such huge strides, but I think they've always gone forward and it's always gotten better. The next sort of thing they might bring in to dabble with, I reckon, will be Red Ball in the domestic setup, which I think would be welcoming because, as I mentioned earlier, like most of us are cricket badgers and we grow up watching test cricket and who doesn't want to test themselves out at some Red Ball? But hopefully, I think the 100 should be, fingers crossed, here to stay and keep progressing the women's game. And then the domestic structure is already at such a brilliant place. It's only in its starting infancy and that's already feeding into the England team. We're already seeing so many more additions to the England squad than we have done for years and years thanks to the domestic contracts so hopefully we'll have a fully domestic professional setup I think that's needed next not just the five at each region and just yeah hopefully I think the main thing is we just keep going forward it doesn't stagnate or um, stall and we're not thankful that we've got to this stage and we'll just leave it there just need we need to keep pushing and that's down to us in the game to keep pushing it and also do you think that the media coverage is something that's hugely important you know I hear there's loads of really good podcasts around the women's game out there that are really helping to boost it so maybe that's something that's having a huge impact too I mean I've not been on any of these podcasts I don't know what you could be talking about um yeah I mean obviously it's people like yourselves it's like cricket her that started paving the way and you know putting people on a map we've always said if you can't see it you can't be it and no one knew I played cricket for about 20 years of my life and now suddenly the hundreds put us on terrestrial free to view tv like that's insane so the platform needs to keep building live stream is, is done wonders the northern diamonds we're doing some great work to try and build our profile you know we've got a presence at the outside of the stadium now with banners and and things like that and it's showing girls that this is an option now so if we can keep building that we I think not don't rest on those laurels hope people like yourselves keep putting in loads of work to keep putting our names out there and yeah keep putting on a good show because we've said all along if people watch what we we produce it's a good it's a bloody good product and so we just need people to see it it's crazy to think that you were the guardian women's cricketer of the year only two years ago and now you're saying that people are only just realizing that you're playing cricket Actually, I'm still claiming that I'm Guardian Women's Cricket of the Year because the award didn't take place last year. So I'm just claiming it rolled over. So I'm like 2019, 2020, 2021, Guardian Women's I think you can say that you won it two years running then. Yeah, I've just, yeah, which is more than I can say for my cricket career running anything two years running. Yeah, the winning that award was like Raf Nicholson plucking me out and saying, look, this girl's story needs to be told. And because no one knew it, like I'd got, all these wickets or I was doing anything because you're just doing it at Harrogate on a weekend for out of your own pocket and unless you're a really niche women's cricket fan I wasn't a name I'm still really not a name but the 100 for the first time ever you're seeing people with Levick shirts and 23s which blew my mind or people actually know who you are rather than oh do you play cricket because you happen to be at the ground on that day sort of thing. A final question from me is you've mentioned that for you if you get to play for England it's great but it's not the be all and end all 
of your career if given the opportunity to play in the WBBL and if India establishes a women's Premier League would you want to play in those? Oh, absolutely, yeah. I just kept trying to tell Laura Kimmins that if they ever need a leggy, she's got my number. But who knows? Those opportunities don't tend to come around for the domestic sort of players, so I'm not holding my breath, but I think that would be a, a massive step I would love to take and I would definitely take if it came around because proving yourself in other countries is something I've not had the opportunity to do because we don't tend to tour as a domestic side and, you know, Yorkshire don't get the opportunity to go and play in India often. But, yeah, I definitely, that would be a nice little goal to tick off. So if any big bash teams follow you guys and they're, they're looking for a leggy that can hit absolute bombs at 11, then hit me up. We like to finish off quite often with some, some of the big questions, you know, the really important ones. So Alex, do you want to start us off with what is Hannah's favourite question to ask? Well, she's got two. She's got a favourite sledge and favourite tea item, but we'll go with favourite sledge first. Favourite sledge? I don't even sledge. That's the worst thing. I just chat constant crap at people and I think that annoys them. But yeah, I mean, I, I genuinely can't think of any time I've had any sledging in my game, which is probably going to make me sound really weak. But like, I remember at Thunder game, I came in and I think I hit up four of my first ball and Hartley chirps that I should be higher up the order. And I told her back I'd be back in five in her team, so I'll get back in your box sort of thing. But um, I don't really sledge like in a nice way. I just, I think of me, so, <laughs> which is not the way I would recommend. But it's quite hard to sledge when I'm at third man, to be honest. Like you have to shout your best jokes and it doesn't go down well then. Okay, so Hannah's other favourite que- que- question. Her favourite question. What is your favourite tea item? That's something I really miss in COVID times, having proper teas provided for us. I love a scone. And I eat far too many of them. I hope to God we've already bowled first because then I can put my feet up and eat 35 scones. But Cream and jam or jam and cream? Jam and cream. Is and the would you not go for it, a Yorkshire curd tart? No, I'm more likely to go, oh, at the, the finals at the weekend, we had Yorkshire puddings after the game and that was a very nice touch. Smash many a Yorkshire pudding. So that's up there as well as a tea item. Not, not conventional tea item, but post-final, I'm absolutely flagging out of my arse. I need some carbs, Yorkshire pudding. Interesting. Okay, so what's the last Netflix series you binged? Probably RuPaul, because I watch RuPaul on repeat. RuPaul's Drag Race constantly. Although I feel like I've completed Netflix. Like, lockdown did me no wonders. I watched everything on it, and there's nothing left to go. I watched all the sports stuff, and then RuPaul just gets put on a repeat. Favourite wicket you've taken? Oh, this is, like, this is where I'm going to probably sound like an absolute arrogant tit where I genuinely love every time I get someone who's capped out and me and my dad will send each other a little cheeky message where I've got another capped player out. Probably my first wicket was Beth Morgan, which I think is a very good trivia point and is a nice claim to fame that I announced myself onto the scene at 16 and got Beth Morgan out and she's brilliant. So she's definitely up there. But yeah, I think probably, I think if you look back through most Kia Super Leagues, I've got most internationals out. So you can't really rank one above the other. So I'm just going to claim... All of them are equally special, kids. Favourite genre of music? Um, I mean, my background might be a giveaway. Fleetwood Mac and David Bowie. Really into indie and old rock and old stuff. Very much old before my time. Very much showing men 31 years of age. 31 years young. Don't look a day over 30, I heard. I thought you were saying that to me. Oh, fighting back now. If you were to go on a tour somewhere, where would you want to play? Favourite country you'd like to go to and play cricket? If I'm going on tour, I'd love to do Vegas. Um, no. If it's to play cricket, uh, I did, I've done South Africa and that was amazing. I'd love to go back and play there. Australia, I've never had the opportunity to go across to, so that would be a massive one on the bucket list. Hopefully, travel restrictions ease sometime in my career and regional teams decide they've suddenly got the money to go to Australia, because that would be great. OK, so if you had the choice of winning the 100 or beating the Vipers in every game you ever played against them from now onwards, what are you going for? Ooh. I mean, if I win the 100, odds on I beat some Vipers players, because they'll probably be in a final, because they always are. But yeah, I would, I'd go winning the 100. It's probably, yeah, I'll get remembered more for winning the 100 than beating the Vipers all the time, to be honest. I want infamy. If you weren't a cricketer, what would, you, what would your job be? I mean, I've technically got a job, so marketing manager, but... If I wasn't a cricketer, I'd like to think I'd have 
the guts to be a stand up. That's always been a back burner. And Jemmy Rodriguez this year, actually, I think that was the greatest compliment I received during the hundred is she told me I have to go into stand up. So I thought if my humour's got appeal more than just myself, then maybe I've got a shot at it. So yeah. I'm thinking we do like a women's cricket fundraiser thing. We get you on stand up, we get Jemmy on the guitar. Go get Wolfie singing because that Wolfie song we've sung every day since we heard it and it's on Spotify. I highly recommend everyone goes and Googles Laura Wolfart because we're all falling in love again and who can't relate to that? I mean, I'm, I'm waiting for the falling in love to happen, but one day. I mean, I think we've had a pretty good plug to get us all off the market in this episode so far. We mentioned Raw Single Ladies. <laughs> Just quickly, Lev, uh, Lev um, where can our listeners find you on social media, on Twitter, and on the gram? Uh, I wonder where you. I'm glad you specified Instagram and Twitter then, because I was going to be like, I'm on OnlyFans. If you want to join up, <laughs> I'm on uh, Instagram um, at Katie underscore Lev, and the same for Twitter, because um, they're the two names I go by. Wonderful. And when will we see you? Where can t- listeners get their tickets for your first stand-up show? Uh, you'll have to ask my agent, Jemmy Rodriguez. She's controlling the tour dates. Um, I think I'm starting off in India um, and then I'll hopefully get around the UK afterwards. But keep your eyes peeled on Katie Lev's Twitter and Instagram because no doubt I'll be plugging my jokes there. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for joining us because this has been a lot of fun. You're doing wonderful things. We love to see you play. I promise you, we will support you as a northerner, you know. I, I, as I told you before, I'm half a northerner, so, you know, I'll support you, even if you're playing the Vipers, because we know I've got a little soft spot. But it's just because I wear orange, I promise. But thank you so much for joining us. It's been amazing. Thanks for having me, and I hope any of that is usable, because I don't hold my breath much. Apologies. <laughs> Massive thank you to Katie for coming on and being a guest on the podcast, and stay tuned for her stand-up comedian tour dates because those will be announced very shortly, thanks to Jemima Rodriguez, her agent. But on a serious note, it was really great to chat to Katie about all things cricket, her love of Yorkshire, and the fact that she could have potentially played for a different team in the 100, but decided to stay loyal to the Northern Superchargers. And to all our listeners, if you want to keep up to date with everything we're doing, you can follow us on Twitter at WCricketChat, on Instagram at Women's Cricket Chat. And if you want to give us a like on Facebook, we are Women's Cricket Chat. If you'd like to give our personal Twitters a follow, then it's at Hannity1194, at Georgie Heath27, at Cassie Coombs98, and I'm at Alex Jane Pereira on Twitter. This has been Women's Cricket Chat. Tune in next time.